So, the way, as you indicated, I was also interested in, well, what does it mean? You know, why did they build those Gothic cathedrals? And we sort of see them, well, that's for architectural history to address. Well, life doesn't work that way. You know, we have biology, physics, and chemistry, but the world doesn't have those categories. They're just con academically convenient for us. There's holistic realities. And how do these buildings fit into these holistic realities? And so thinking in terms of uh, mythology, archetypes, and architecture maybe will help us think that way. So there's archetypes and manifestations. And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. But an archetype is a general underlying principle. A manifestation is a manifestation of that principle in particular circumstances. So uh, one example would be to say that a dying and resurrecting God born of a virgin and associated with a cross is an archetype. Its manifestations might be a, Adonis with the Greeks, Tammuz for the Mesopotamians, Quaxcoral for the Mayans and Aztecs, and Christ for Christians. So this dying the resurrecting God, born of a virgin associated with a cross, and with a difficult relationship to the Father, uh, you can sort of like see that archetypal pattern. And once you understand that pattern, when you're looking at Christ or Quaxpoto or Dionysius or Osiris, suddenly whole things come into focus. An indication of this approach, there's a movie from some years ago called Serpico. Anybody ever see Serpico? It's Al Pacino playing, uh, it was based on true story. So there was a New York policeman named Serpico Young coming into the force and he's assigned to this is in the 1970s, to uh, the drug detail. And it turns out 90% of the cops working on drugs are corrupt. They're taking money from drug dealers. And no, on a cop's salary, it's kind of hard to resist. Somebody says, look, here's an envelope. There's $100,000 cash in there. Why don't you pretend you didn't see this? That <laughs> pays off your mortgage, put your kid through college just in one envelope. So the whole thing was really corrupt, and Serpico was not corruptible, and so they turned on him. And this eventually led to a huge scandal. Movie was made, the police force was cleaned out, and my mother's watching the movie and she says, it's Antigone. So Antigone has to choose between you know family, her, her obligations to her family and her obligations to Greek tragedy and her obligations to the state. And so being in that conflicting situation is the underlying archetypal story. Another example would be the Lion King. So Disney was working on the Lion King. They, were, they weren't exactly focused what it was about. And suddenly someone said, it's Hamlet. And said, oh my God, now it's clear what it's about. And they could you know, finish the movie, make one of the most successful animation movies ever. So to say it's Hamlet is the archetype. Manifestation is the Lion King. We saw that when I was describing Louis Kahn. For Kahn, form is the archetype, underlying principle. And design is the manifestation in these particular circumstances. For Louis Sullivan, he uses the term function for the archetype and form for the manifestations. So these terms are all over the place, but that's what they mean. Once you start being able to think this way in architecture, all this stuff starts to become clear. So if you start with saying, okay, that's a mandala. Now what is a mandala? So you can have an understanding of mandala. A mandala is a description of the organization of the universe. It's a description of the or diagram of the organization of the mind. 
and it's a tool for putting the mind in harmony with the universe. And it's a series of concentric geometric forms, and it's a palace or city with a wall and four gates. And then we see Beijing, the wall or the moat, the four gates. Beijing is, Beijing is deflected so that it's up like that, so it's more open to the, to the south. That's Borobudur, that's Angkor Wat, that's a Hindu temple, that's a Hindu sacred city. So you say, oh, that's a mandala. Now I understand. This is a diagram of the universe, a diagram of the mind, and a tool for putting the mind in harmony with the universe. And so grasping this underlying pattern, a whole series of architectures become apparent. Now, if you run into uh, a symmetrical building in another culture, is it a mandala or not? You know, it's like you need a lot of pieces to start to sort of put this together. All tall structures are not necessarily pyramids. So you might say the Aztec things that the Aztecs sacrificed people and rolled their heads down are temples and not pyramids because they're built by empires. Empires don't build pyramids, but they do build temples. And we see E.C. Shrine as a manifestation of the granary. And we also saw the importance of the granary for the Dogon. There is an interpretation of the Greek temple that it's a granary. It's not a widely held interpretation, so I wouldn't, I'm not sure one way or the other. But it gives you this insight into why, why is it raised off the ground? Why is, you know, oh, it's a granary. Granaries, why granaries raised off the ground? These things then start clicking into place. We looked at New Grange Passage Map, and we saw this passageway into the mound and a transept. So an apse, transept, and a nave. And here we are, 3000 to 2500 BCE, and here we are around, this is Chartres, it's around 1100 AD. So let's make this 1,000 and 2,500. So we've got 3,500 years later, they're still building this same underlying pattern. The manifestation is very different, but the underlying archetypal pattern is very similar. And we see this in Neolithic burial sites, perhaps, you are going into the body of the goddess in depth. There's a typically burial mounds. In depth, you return, you are born from the body of the goddess, and the goddess is the universe, and you return to the body of the goddess. So um, this is an entering into the body of the goddess, entering into the uh, body of transcendence, entering a Gothic cathedral. So here are these archetypal ways of thinking. And like once you get it, you understand the pattern, things will click for you and then it'll all unfold. You can figure it out for yourself. So now let's take a look at uh, another application of this approach in movies but it's sort of see how this tool works. So I'm relying on the work of Joseph Campbell. We've been reading him. So Campbell lived from uh, 1904 to 1987 with um, very influential through his television interviews, lectures. He influenced movies, some influence in academia, not a lot. New Consciousness Movement refers a lot to Campbell and his books were very widely read. And when Campbell um, referred to mythology, he didn't just mean, oh, stories of Zeus and Apollo or 
uh, Bolton or whatever. But if you looked at a culture's entire art, architecture, religion, myths, uh, all as manifestation of these same patterns. And he saw uh, that myth was a language that addressed our lives personally, spiritually, culturally, and cosmologically. So when you read Hero of the Thousand Faces and you read the final section, there's a lot about Hindu cosmology. You say, oh my God, that's how we're seeing the universe today. That's how, you know, these infinite parallel universes. Oh yeah, you know. And then they're, they're illustrative of other ways in which we're thinking. So Campbell says, myth is the secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Now, Campbell's not that widely accepted in academia these days. And I'm going to suggest it's because when you run your rats through mazes, you can't measure changes in co the cosmological energies. <laughs> in other words, he's talking in a poetic, metaphorical way that's totally out of favor in contemporary academia. But I contend you cannot talk about art. You can't talk about a Gothic cathedral without talking that way. In other words, why did they build those Gothic cathedrals? Well, there's this economic thing and means of production and uh, trade with the East and growth and wealth. Yeah, but the reason they built it was to build a giant entity to help them be in touch with the larger cosmos. That's why they built it. Absolutely, yeah. So when, I, when I'm talking about this, I said, suppose you're taking your child to the first day in a new school, and you're walking up, you know, holding them by the hand, you're walking up the path to the school, and the question is, is this a place where it's good to learn? Is this a place where my child can discover who they are and have the opportunity to have for them to flourish and for them to discover and manifest who and what they're going to become? Yeah, we need enough square footage and the roof shouldn't leak, <laughs> but that's not what we're here for. <laughs> so yeah, if you don't if you don't talk about to use your term atmosphere, the, the <laughs> It's not architecture. Well, it might as well just have school and a warehouse. Everybody use, you know, do everything in warehouses. So one of one of uh, uh, quote that manifests this idea, and here are the thousand faces he wrote in 1947. So this is 1947, the corner of Fifth Avenue and uh, 42nd Street, <laughs> and Campbell writes. The latest incarnation of Oedipus, the continued romance of Beauty and the Beast, stands this afternoon on the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue waiting for the traffic light to change. <laughs> and they're all waiting for the traffic light to change. But every one of these people is a story, is a manifestation, is a, a life drama. And you can, you know, walk through life saying, my job is to earn enough money to feed my family. Or you can say, yeah, i got to do that, but my job is to identify who I am and to be able to manifest and project that. What is my story? Who am I? So one kind of myth is called the hero journey. Campbell presented, identified that pattern in a 1949 book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And the hero journey is a pattern in myths, religions, fairy tales, novels, and individual mystical experiences. He lumps them all together, in which a hero is called to the quest and goes through a series of stages. Odysseus in the Odyssey, at the end of the war, sets off for home. The call to adventure, Odysseus is blown off course and goes to the land of the lotus eaters. What does that imply? Ooh -wee, ooh -wee, 
we're going to ingest some psychedelics here and go on an adventure. He enters the realm of fabulous forces and survives a, ser a series of successions of trial. He encounters the, cyclos, the, cy the cyclops, the sirens, again and again. He has all these adventures and trials. And Campbell also points out that they complete him as a human being. He's not ready to go home yet. He has to be rounded out as a human being. Um, he comes into touch with the three sides of the feminine. The, um, the matronly, the um, seductress, and the youth. He, his greatest journey is to the underworld, where he gathers wisdom which you can't get anywhere else. He then comes home and wins a decisive victory. He slays the suitors. And thereby, Odysseus and Penelope are reunited and the world is enriched. So there's our hero journey. So let's um, take a 15 minute break and we'll see how that hero journey gets manifest, that uh, archetype is gonna get manifest in a series of manifestations. So in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Campbell describes this hero journey in which a figure is called to a quest and goes through a series of stages. Um, the hero is in ordinary reality. There's a call to adventure, uh, goes to a special reality where fabulous forces are encountered. Often there's a twin, often there's an um, encounter with the father. A decisive victory is won and a return to enrich the world. So that's the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, the boy with the seven big boots. Um, fairy tales, the story of Christ, Mohammed, and Buddha. And we've seen it uh, quite locally, as in the first Star Wars, now known as Episode four. So Luke Skywalker is on the farm in ordinary reality, but he's longing for something. And then comes the call to adventure. So the droid that he picks up is projecting a hologram. Obi-Wan, help me. Obi-Wan, help me. Who is Obi-Wan? Maybe he's that old guy out in the desert. Obi-Wan Kenobi great Jedi warrior. And uh, he is reintroduced to his heritage, his father's lightsaber, saber. and in the, uh, at a threshold, which is the bar scene with the weird creatures, and then off to space adventures, where he's engaged in these battles, and he's going to encounter, who's this? And who's Darth Vader? Right. So, very rich interrelationships here. And who's this? And who's Princess Leia? His twin sister. So it's right, I mean, you can find a hundred myths that this is, ex you know, exactly illustrative of. And then, use the force Luke and he destroys the Death Star and returns to aid the just cause of the rebels. One of the reasons uh, <laughs> this is so close to the to uh, Campbell's book is that George used Campbell's book as a textbook for how to make the movie. Now George could actually read a book but the um, most Hollywood people can't. So Christopher Vogler uh, was working at Disney and he prepared a, he prepared a um, seven page memo that described what I just described, all the stages in a hero journey, all the stages in a hero journey made it seven pages, 
and it got passed around among the executives at Disney, and it became a, um, a guide that everybody reading a um, reading a screenplay it had to conform to this outline. So all movies now have this structure because Christopher Volga wrote this memo, and then he says, everybody wants the original memo. He couldn't find it. You know, he kept expanding on it. You know, it was typewritten. They didn't have a computer then. But this describes the, the ordinary world, the special world, the stages the hero goes through in, um, let's see, the ordinary world, call to adventure. Now there can be a refusal of the call, Meeting the mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Crossing the threshold at the bar. Tests allies, enemies. He's going to be bumping into, he's got his two little hero helpers, C-3PO and R2-D2. Um, and then helpers like Obi-Wan Kenobi and uh, Yoda. Approach, ordeal, death, and rebirth. So, part where his father cuts his hand off, and the movie ends there, and he comes back. Reward, seizing the sword, the road back, resurrection, return with elixir, the thing that enriches the world. So there's the, there's the structure. If you want to ever write a screenplay, that's the structure. They all have to have that structure. You have a, um, there's a separation from the feminine. There has to be a reuniting with the feminine, um, etc. Well, eventually, an old trunk found the original. And in all these parts, the mentors, the herald, uh, etc. The memo that started it all. From time to time, people asked me for a copy of the original seven-page memo. He couldn't find it. Finally, he found it. So you can now get the original. And then he made it into a book. So this is the book that tells you, this is the book that all screenwriters have to read. And it tells you the, the story, you know, the structure of a movie. Now, when we talked about the West, I mentioned the Arthurian romances, stories of King Arthur, Knights of the Round Table, and uh, one passage, they thought it would be a disgrace to go forth in a group, so each entered the forest at a point he himself chose where it was darkest and there was no path or way. So in other cultures, you follow the traditions. In Western culture, you have to be original. If you do, that's plagiarism, that's somebody else's work, if you do uh, follow the tradition. Now, more specifically, one of these myths is the Percival myth. And Percival is uh, a very pure knight and is out on a quest. He enters the castle of the Fisher King who has been wounded, and his wound will not heal, and his kingdom has become a wasteland. wasteland. If the king is sick, the kingdom is sick. So Percival, who had always acted spontaneously out of his own nature, this time recalls you're not supposed to speak to a king until spoken to first. So he does not ask what ails you, the words that would have healed the king. He fails the quest. And he's exiled from the castle, but then in many adventures he comes to love Kandwir, her name evoking guide, Campbell distinguishes three kinds of love, eros, cardinal love, agipe, spiritual love, and a more love for an individual person, again, a uniquely Western notion. In this kind of relationship to a woman, Percival again finds the castle, asks the king what ails you, heals the king, and restores the land. So that's sort of a key, one of the key Arthurian romances, and we can take that as the epic poem describing the moral structure of the West. And we see this idea of this individuality throughout the West so that um, 
The notion is that the moral center is not in society, but in the heart of each individual. So in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, Huck realizes he's committing a horrible crime and sin in helping Jim an escaped slave. And he says, I'm going to go to hell for this, but all right then, I'll go to hell. I'm going to do it anyway. So we realize that it is his inner moral voice is a more valid guide than are the rules of society. And then we see um, two great 30s, 40s mystery writers in America are Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. And Chandler writes in an essay about the American detective story, down these mean streets a man must go, who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The detective must be a complete man and a common man and yet an unusual man. He must be, to use a rather weather, weathered phrase, a man of honor. Okay, so we've got the, the, the man is going to go down these mean streets. And that's a, a half of all the movies ever made. That's John Wayne in Stagecoach, Humphrey Bogart in The Maltese Falcon, Shane in Shane, Alan Ladd in Shane. It's Vin Diesel in Riddick. It's Matt Damon in The Board Identity. It's Angelina Jolie in Salt. So this movies are now the carriers of our myths. And you see a movie, you say, oh, that's the Percival myth. Oh, that's the, you know, you, you see the Lion King. Oh, that's Hamlet. And so we have these underlying archetypes that then become manifest in particular circumstances of the given story. It's Robert Redford in The Natural, straight from Percival. And, and then, anybody see the movie Wanted? It's a really good movie. Now, um, Star Wars and The Matrix had three movies to do it. So, and Star Wars is, you know, then went to six. But this movie suffers a bit from trying to compress the whole thing into one movie. Should have been, you know, a trilogy, but it's really great. Uh, now, let's just look at Clint Eastwood and take him as the archetype for our, you know, the movie star of our time. So the role that John Wayne played that Jimmy Stewart played that, um, no, this, this is, uh, <laughs> they all look the same. <laughs> the same photographer. Anyway, and so for the 60s through the 80s, um, Clint Eastwood played this role. So 64 to 66, he does the Spaghetti Western, Spaghetti Westerns, uh, directed by Sergio Leone. Uh, shot in Spain, the Man with No Name trilogy. So he's the characters are nihilistic and after the gold. But then um, he does a series of Dirty Harry movies, and Harry Callahan is a San Francisco police detective who is angry at the corruption in the police department and takes on the world himself. And then he does In the Line of Fire, interesting movie. And here he plays, he's uh, a bodyguard, he's JFK's favorite Secret Service bodyguard. He's riding the bumper, and when Kennedy is shot, he fail, he freezes and fails to jump and take the second bullet. He's now exiled to work in counterfeiting. Secret Service guards the president and does counterfeiting. That's his two jobs. I don't know why, but. Uh, and then a, a threat comes to the current president. They discover an apartment that has all these stories about him pinned to, the, uh, pinned to a bulletin board. And the potential assassin of the current president calls him up. 
So now he comes back onto active duty in the Presidential Guard because the potential assassin is in touch with him. And there's now, Rene Russo, um, a woman, Secret Service agent, involved with the case. And he says, a woman? You know, he's a total misogynist. So uh, he can't stand the fact that there's this woman. But they have to work together. Here he is out on detail. They run with a finger on the car so they can follow everything that's going on. And eventually he starts to develop a relationship with her. And then the president is going to a big event in Los Angeles, and it's in the Bonaventure Hotel, and they're staking it out, and he's, there, he's sure they've missed something. And sure enough, the bad guy is slipping through security. He's got a plastic gun that'll go through, um, go through the metal detector. The, the, the bullets are part of his key ring, so they'll go through the metal detector. And he has figured it out. He spots it. He jumps. He takes the bullet, wearing a vest, uh, saves the day, and uh, does in the bad guy, and is thanked by the president. And then, uh, in in a more in love with Lily, Frank gets a second chance. This time, takes the bullet and saves the president. And there they are together. Total Percival story. <laughs> it's like a, they just they just changed the characters' names, and so then you start seeing these structures, whether they're in movies, in literature, and as we saw in the opening in architecture. So remember, I talking about the West. I said that Robert Thurman is proposing an idea of a second Renaissance, saying that the West understanding and control of the material world will combine with the Buddhist understanding of mind to bring about a second renaissance. What will that world be like? Well, what happens when the East comes to the West? So here's Grand Torino, 2008. Anybody see this one? So this is a, a more recent Clint Eastwood movie. He's, he keeps saying he's retired, but he's really old now. So. He's still directing, but he hasn't acted, I think, since this one. And he's playing Walt Kozłowski. And so he's Polish, uh, auto worker, Korean War veteran. His wife just died. It opens with her funeral. And then there's a scene at the doctor. He's got lung cancer. His, all his family members are brats. He doesn't get along with his grandkids or his kids. And his neighborhood is being taken over by Hmong. Uh, by Hmong. He's got Hmong neighbors. These are Vietnamese mountain people. But they also, they, they have gangs. He's, he doesn't put up with their BS. He's got his guns left over from the war. Cops aren't going to do anything about it. Doesn't help to call the cops. And his among neighbors start taking, you see this old man, a widow, widower. They take him in, they feed him. <laughs> he's having a hard time with the strange food. And he's a real misogynist, uh, you know. Um, no, he's not a misogynist. He's very taciturn. Doesn't like talking to people. Uh, but he starts becoming a protector of the neighbor kids. This girl is getting in trouble with the gangs. He uh, tells them to knock it off. The neighboring boy tries to steal his car, and he, because uh, the gang's forcing him to do it, and he you know, has to try to act like a father figure for the kid. The gangs aren't gonna leave the kid alone. Uh, they beat up and rape the girl. Um, so now he's got to do something about it. He can't just shoot all of them uh, like Dirty Harry would have. So he takes his dog next door to the Hmong grandmother, gives him, he says, you're going to take care of the dog. He goes off uh, to their, their gang house and very threateningly reaches for a cigarette lighter. They kill him and they're all going to jail. 
So he, found, he as a Buddhist bodhisattva, he found a right action solution to the problem. The monk come to his funeral and he left everything in his will to the um, to the, the house, to the church, and his Gran Torino car. It's the last one to come off the production line that he worked on, and his mechanics tools to the boy. And so the boy's now going to have, you know, be able to make a life for himself. So here we see this totally Buddhist manifestation. You know, he's a bodhisattva. So now what will be the new mythology? And Joseph Campbell likes to say, one can no more say than one could say what will be tonight's dream. They both come from the same realm. So here's a suggestion. How many people have seen this movie? Okay, so this movie is moving its way up on the list of the greatest movies of all time. And lots of people have it in their, you know, like top 10 lists. It's, it's a romantic comedy, but people begin to realize this is a really serious, profound movie. So Bill Murray is playing Phil Connors, an obnoxious TV weatherman, and his producer, Rita, uh, and he have to go off to film Groundhog Day. So here they are off on their adventure. What, what in, the, in the hero journey, what is this? What are they doing? Separation from ordinary reality. We go over a bridge. It's symbolic to we're going to another realm. Something's going to happen. And we enter the town of Puxatawney, Pennsylvania. So this is a magical place. This is a special place. And he's staying in a little bed and breakfast, very charming. And six o'clock in the morning, his clock radio goes off, gets up, and he does his broadcast where Puxahawney, Puxahawney Phil, the groundhog, comes out of his burrow, and either he does or does not see a shadow, which says whether or not there'll be six more weeks of winter. And then he want, they, they're about to leave. They can't leave. There's a snowstorm. All communications are shut down. You can't make a phone call. They can't get out. So goes to bed. We'll be stuck here tomorrow. Clock radio goes off. Welcome. Good morning. It's Groundhog Day. What? Didn't we just do that yesterday? He goes off. He does the broadcast again. <laughs> and, uh, but then this happens again and again and again. He's experiencing continuing time. But for everybody else, it's Groundhog Day. He says, but didn't we just do this yesterday? Well, what are you talking about? Today's today. So he goes to a doctor, does an x-ray. Do I have a brain tumor? Uh, can't find anything. So he says, if there's no tomorrow, what would that mean? It means we could do anything we want. He goes out. He gets drunk. He, each morning for him, he steals a bag full of money so he can have a good day. Uh, and he seduces girls. Uh, you know, plays out his fantasies. Here he is as Clint Eastwood, <laughs> the girl dressed up as a French maid going to the movie theater. Uh, and, but his broadcast, he has to do the broadcast every day. And he's done it now hundreds of times. This goes on for hundreds of times. And his producer's getting real annoyed because he's getting real cynical. And uh, I can't stand it anymore. And so he commits suicide. Doesn't help, wakes up the next morning. Commits suicide again. Doesn't help, wakes up the next morning. Tries dropping a toaster in a bathtub. Doesn't help, wakes up the next morning. Oh, and he says, you know what? 
how do I take advantage of this to make myself into a decent person? So, his broadcasts start getting better. He brings coffee and donuts in the morning, teaches himself French poetry, learns how to play the piano. He has, you know, he's got years to do this. There are just hundreds and hundreds of day, uh, February 2nds available to him. Uh, and then he discovers everybody who gets into trouble that day, Kit falls out of the tree, gets killed. So he makes sure he's there. <laughs> Every morning he's out oh, at 10 o'clock, gotta rush off, catch the kid. Uh, and his broadcast becomes really beautiful and people are really turned on by how poetic it is. His producer says, Phil, I didn't know you were such a poet. And uh, he's the hit of the party uh, with his newly learned piano playing and he's hitting it off where he's always been after her and they're beginning to hit it off and then the next day he gets February 3rd and he proposes to her and they say let's live here. Now the, producer, the screenwriter and director Harold Rain says at first I would get emails saying oh you must be a Christian because the movie so beautifully expresses Christian belief. Then rabbis started calling him Buddhist. Well, I knew they loved it because my mother-in-law has lived in a Buddhist meditation center for 30 years. <laughs> so Buddhists, Jews, Christians are all like, yeah, this, they're using the movie in their sermons. Now, there's a notion of Friedrich Nietzsche where he says, what if someday or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you have lived it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times over. In other words, he proposes a theory of time where you will live your life over and over forever. Now, people have interpreted this as a theory of time on Nietzsche's part, but it's not. What it is, is he's saying, if this were the case, what would you do? You'd want to make it a pretty good life. <laughs> if you're going to have to live it over and over. And uh, Steve Jobs said that too. This was uh, after his first illness. He knew he wasn't going to live very long, but he was healthy at the moment. I have looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. And Roger Ebert, great film critic, say in his review of the movie, we see that life is like that. In other words, yeah, we all live day after day. The question is, what are we going to do with that day? And he says, the good news is that we can learn to be better people. So here is a totally new myth presented in a movie. So again, when you see these patterns, when you see uh, a sacred city, a Hindu temple, Beijing, Borobudur, Angkor Wat, you recognize, oh, that's a mandala. And you know what a mandala means. And then you see how it's being manifest in these manifestations. When you see Isi shrines, oh, that's a granary, rice. Now, what else is true about rice? It's a source of food, but what is special of wheat, white? What is characteristic of wheat, rice, and corn? Every year, you plant it and you harvest it. You kill it, you cut it off, you sacrifice it. And then what does it do next to you? It grows again. A dying and resurrecting God. That dying and resurrecting gods are agricultural gods. And so this granary is suddenly not, okay, you want, you know, and when we have Tupperware, um, um, bins to so store it in, we don't, we don't need these things anymore. No, these things are symbolic of this cyclical quality of life in these agricultural cultures. And then Newgrange Passage Mound to 
the Gothic cathedral. Over th three or 4,000 years of building the same thing. And it is this underlying way of, of the, this sick cycle of return, the entering the body of the goddess, re-entering the earth. And we see this in the treasury of Atreus. It's the same thing. It even has the light box above the window, same as New Grange Passage Map. So you look at treasury of Atreus and say, oh my God. And then the bodies would be put in there after people died and they stay there for several years and then they're buried so that they don't pile up. But everybody gets some time in there to, to go through that process of reabsorption back into the body of the cosmos. And so then you see it that way and you say, oh, that's what they're doing. There are um, Chinese burial mounds that are used exactly that way. So that's mythology and archetypes.